The Legal Corner podcast series. Welcome to today's episode of The Legal Corner, a podcast which covers a variety of legal issues to keep you informed. Hosted by attorney at law Colin Dinoon and communication specialist Leonardo Torres. So great to be with you again for another episode of the Legal Corner podcast series. In today's episode, we are going to be looking at small climate change and small island developing states. Our distinguished guest today is Ms. Alana Malin S. N. Lancaster, and she is a lecturer in law at the University of the West Indies, Keville Campus. Uh, just to tell you a bit about her, she is a Guyanese Barbadian environmental and human rights lawyer, academic, and national resources specialist. She is currently a lecturer in international environmental and energy law and head of the newly formed Environmental Law, Ocean, Governance and Climate Justice Unit of the Univers- of the Faculty of Law. Alana is also a co-investigator and member of the executive team of the GCRF-funded One Ocean Hub and serves as the regional deputy director of the Global Network for Human Rights and the Environment for the Caribbean. Alana also specializes in international, regional, CARICOM, and OECS, and comparative marine environmental law, international energy law, and has increasingly incorporated in her research a focus on human rights, in particular the rights of min- minority groups, children, and youth, to a clean, healthy, sustainable environment, investment law, business and human rights, and climate justice. All right. So, uh, good day to you, Mr. Lancaster, and welcome to the Legal Corner podcast series. Hi, uh, good good morning, Colin. Uh, lo- uh, thank you for having me on this series. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be lovely. here. Lovely. Well, we're good to get... Sorry? Are you hearing me? Right. Yeah, lovely. Yes, I'm hearing you. Okay. Uh, well, we're going to get right into it. Uh, it's, 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 I am happy to have you, and thank you so much for being with us. <laughs> Uh, tell us, how has the world arrived at this juncture in the climate crisis? Uh, okay, uh, well, it's. I guess the short version of it is that uh, while uh, global warming, what we term global warming, which is one of the driving factors in climate change, is uh, a natural process that is, that is necessary for, for keeping the, wor- the, the, the earth uh, habitable, uh, so naturally, there is some amount of warming that keeps um, the earth habitable, allows um, ecosystems such as forests and so to grow and us as humans to live. <clears throat> However, what we expect, what we're experiencing, sorry, is related to the anthropogenic factors uh, which uh, have accelerated this process. So because of, of, of a suite of factors, uh, most of the recent uh, impacts are linked to the, the, the era in, in history, uh, which we would term as industrialization. Uh, and so this would have been when a lot of countries would have moved from primarily agrarian economies to manufacturing. And these countries, of course, uh, would have been what we what uh, I suppose in today's terms are called the global north. Uh, essentially, uh, former colonial powers are, are, and in some cases, countries like the US, uh, Canada and Australia, which were once colonized but are now uh, industri- what, we, what we consider it more industrialized nations. Uh, so the accelerated um, inputs of, of certain gases are the primary one of which is, is, is carbon dioxide, as, as we uh, may know, but there are a, a wide range of gases and other um, well, primarily gases which contribute, including methane, for example, and 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 so on. What, what are now being termed black carbon. So uh, during the industrial uh, era, uh, in the move to industrialize, you would have had a lot of um, factories and so on, and and the main uh, fuel used were our carbon based or carbon associated fuels, and in those days, coal and now oil and gas. And the these burn emitters. Uh, this effect. So what we're looking at are are the impacts 
that we are addressing now are related to the anthropogenic or, or man-made impacts which have are have now accelerated uh and are, are now driving this process uh as you would know based on the the the, the paris agreement it's a two degree or or as 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 we now say 1.5 to stay alive uh and this is the the figure that is given that we we need to to stay below or well below for to, to stave off some of the impacts of climate change uh well, and that is now driving this crisis uh and again when people uh ask you know about the climate crisis this is not a this is not a new phenomenon it's been referenced uh since the, uh, I would say the 1800s or even before by scientists such as the um, Swe- uh, Swedish scientist Arrhenius. He he references. So it's something we've known about uh, for quite a while, but really and truly uh, uh, there's been global action since 1992 with the passage of the United, the United Nations Convention on Climate Change uh, and its most recent iteration, um, the Paris Agreement. Uh, however, I would say even though we've known, we've done a lot of, of activities. So in addition to these industrialized activities, uh, some of the, the key drivers include uh, transportation, for example. Uh, transportation is, a, 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 and, and this is driven by, of course, urbanization. Most countries, uh, you know, more and more are, are you know, increasing urban centers. Uh, you know, we have more uh cars and and auto uh you know buses and so on which use a uh, carbon based fuel um and this these are some of the driving it. So, so certainly if you think of the caribbean uh, certainly um when i when i think of of cities like i was born in in georgetown guyana when i think of georgetown now as as when i was uh, a young girl or even a teenager you you can see the differences in 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 um uh, vehicular use, for example, uh, increased consumerism, and you know, uh, again, growing up, uh, a lot of the activities that generate, you know, fuel, uh, carbon, and so were not um, uh, as widespread. So it's it, it's a combination. If I were to sum summarize, it's a combination of factors which have accelerated a nat- a, a process which is uh, natural. Uh, so and and so that's why many persons will say anthrop- anthropogenic um or driven crime and change the IPCC report so they the the projections and the data in the IPCC report relate to the anthropogenic causes uh, uh and if i might uh just say one final thing on this is that one of the 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 reasons that the climate crisis is so um perhaps serious or, or 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 critical, especially for us in the Caribbean as small island developing states and so on, is that not only do we see the impacts of of of, of um climate change such as you know increased storms. So recently we had Hurricane Beryl, which uh you know really surprised a lot of persons because of, of the strength it gained in such a short time. So we're gonna see more of these storms. We know this. Uh we have a lot of flooding, desertification, and so on. So those are some of the the impacts we know yes. linked to climate change. But there's also a, 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 one of the reasons climate change is so pervasive is that it, it 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 drives the other two main planetary crises of our time, being biodiversity loss and pollution. So uh, 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 as we would have seen uh, in the recent um advisory opinion by the the inter, inter, inter uh sorry the international tribunal for the law of the sea uh, uh greenhouse gases as we call them are considered pollutants of the marine environment but there are also uh other ways in which uh climate re- uh or carbon related um compounds can uh form pollutants and these are of course our plastics uh and these also impact the the impacts of the the 
ga- um, you know, gases as well as plastics, for example, on the marine and terrestrial environment can lead to biodiversity loss. So we've seen, um, and for the Caribbean, again, uh, bringing it back to the Caribbean, we are very, um, we're by biodiversity hotspot. Uh, most of the biodiversity we recognize is on land, but we also have a tremendous biodiversity in the marine environment, which we don't, we, you know, we haven't scratched the surface of. And between the warmer temperatures in the sea, uh, you know, acidification as, as carbon dioxide and other gases uh, immerse in the marine environment, we see increased biodiversity loss, uh, which is, 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 you know, w- one of the the bases of our economies is our biodiversity. So I I think I'll leave that question. I don't know if I've answered your question. <laughs> I want us to talk now about mitigation because we have established what is the problem. All right. But um, I want you to tell us uh, what successes so have been realized as it relates I, to climate what, mitigation what I begin strategies by saying is that, within the Caribbean um, region. And this is within the the climate framework. There are three uh, proposed strategy or, or, or three recognized strategies. So that's mitigation, adaptation, and have uh, loss and damage. Now, mitigation is, of course, the the preferred methodology for addressing the climate um challenge simply because it means that you were re- avoided some of these uh causes of of the climate problem so increased um carbon entering the atmosphere carbon and other g- gases such as black carbon and so on uh but this is something that the Caribbean or Caribbean states, we cannot do alone. Now, one of the things I often hear a, um, that is a, a bit of a fallacy is that, you know, we're not part of the problem because we're, you know, small emitters and so on. Uh, that's a, a bit of a fallacy in that we all contribute to uh, the, the the anthropogenic climate change. So this is kind of like, you know, when they when in Sunday school they tell you there's no small sin or big sins or or whatever we're all it's all, we're all sinning it's just that uh as a Caribbean as a region is not industrialized it's not as industrialized because we do have some states which are industrialized like Trinidad and Trinidad for example hmm. um Trinidad and Tobago um Jamaica etc but um so we are not contributing as much as say uh global north states such as uh uh the US, Canada, um the UK, many countries in Europe and Australia. But we are contributing. Uh so that's one of the things that I I, I like to start with is that uh we're you know this 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 notion that um, we are part of the problem and therefore mitigation is a uh, uh, important consideration. But as I, <clears throat> for reasons I will get into shortly, um, for us, however, priority also has to be given to um adaptation and loss and damage. Now, in terms of <clears throat> mitigation, uh, so essentially we're talking about slowing or cutting down or or as far as possible eliminating uh emissions into uh, of 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 greenhouse gases and of course uh the first action i think um caribbean states would have taken would be would have been to be part of the global process so in 1992 most of our states have signed the the, the climate Con- climate change convention the un convention on climate change we were uh our primary we are what would be termed annex two countries so in other words we're not major um emitters of gases um and we would have signed subsequent agreements the notable ones being the kyoto protocol and now the paris agreement so this places us firmly in in the multilateral process uh additionally under the paris agreement one of the things one of the the requirements is what we call the Deter, um, to identify what um, national determined contributions or NDCs uh, in which are voluntary actions that states will take to mitigate um, the, their, you know, climate change from within their own um, economies, state uh, or, or, or uh, entities. Now, I'm happy to report that many 
states have um, produced NDCs in the Caribbean region. Uh, what I what I what I think the next step needs to be done is actually implement the actions in in these NDCs. Uh, many states have uh, identified uh, mechanisms. So, uh, important mechanism is. Uh, transitioning or what we what, what is being globally termed just transition so transitioning from primarily fossil fuel based economies to renewables now for the majority of of Caribbean states uh this is a this is not only a environmental climate change based um solution but it also makes good economic sense since we are net importers of fuel so with the exception of Trinidad um and I suppose now Guyana do Guyana exports most of its 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 fossil fuels uh um we import and we spend tremendous proportions of our GDP importing fuel to drive trip, um household purposes but also we're main tourism we're main tourism belt so tourism uh transport and so on so re- embarking on uh, on renewable energy sources is a main uh action identified by Caribbean states, which which both links to um, climate mitigation as well as, uh, I guess, sounder economic policies. Uh, I, I like to also highlight that because of the vulnerability of 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 Caribbean states, um, and you, I think I, I I one of the the terms that have been used to describe us are small island developing states. Again, this was uh, a terminology recognized at the nineteen ninety two um Rio conference. Uh, simply to highlight the added vulnerabilities of of cer- uh, certain categories of states found across the Caribbean, Pacific, Africa, and Asia. Uh, in some um, Asian Indian Ocean, in terms of their economies, geographies, and their increased vulnerabilities to, among other things, climate change. Now, because of of of, of these inherent vulnerabilities, even though we are not made um, polluters or, or emitters of greenhouse gases, we are still feeling the impacts. Or we are already feeling the impacts. We, we we will feel them the hardest longest and in the most disproportionate um, ways. And this is linked to, uh, as I said, inherent vulnerabilities, but also our low resilience. Uh, In other words, our ability to bounce back after climate um, impact. And this is related to a variety of factors, including economic as well as geographic factors. Um, So for us, adaptation and the accompanying um, area that has sprung up that of loss and damage are critical. Uh, adaptation is, is critical to stave off the impacts that are already happening and ensure uh, or, or to ensure as far as possible that our our uh, our coast, our societies, our, our states uh, can, uh, I don't want to say repel because, I mean, we can't repel the impacts, but to to, uh, as best as possible, uh, minimize the impacts of climate change. So, uh, things such as you know drought resilience, um, uh, having coastal um ecosystems such as mangroves and coral, which uh, we know um you know act as buffers and slow down the impacts of 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 climate change. And another important one, uh, another important ecosystem which has been undervalued but has been increasingly recognized in the few years is. The, the last, the few years but in the in the, um both the climate as well as the biodiversity system is the ocean uh we and 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 ecosystems what we call blue and teal carbon ecosystems so the ocean is an important resource and i i highlight the ocean because most of the small island developing states uh including those in the caribbean have more ocean uh, in their jurisdictions than they have land masses and the data is conclusive that the ocean absorbs so certainly when i was at university growing up you'd hear you'd hear that the forests are the lungs of the earth and they play an important role in absorbing carbon um and 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 therefore uh minimizing the impact of climate change uh but we've since discovered that the oceans uh absorb much more uh carbon carbon dioxide uh, the oceans and, and ocean ecosystems such as seagrass beds um 
and so on, absorb much more carbon dioxide, as well as what we call blue carbon ecosystems. So these are like uh, mangroves and seagrass beds and teal carbon, which is the intertidal marshes and so on. So these are ecosystems which we still have a, a large proportion of in the Caribbean. We have a lot of ocean under our jurisdiction. And therefore, these are also important to, 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 in the case of the ocean, mitigating um, climate change. And in the case of, of our marine ecosystem or coastal marine ecosystems, to add, um, not only mitigating, but helping us to uh, adapt, you know, slowing down storm waves and, and, and so on and so forth. Finally, I'll, I'll, I'll say a bit on loss and damage because loss and damage is critical um, for states, uh, for both what, what, what is termed slow onset. So, um, you know, things such as drought and, uh, and so on, which are creeping factors related to climate change that can impact our economies and societies, as well as fast onset events such as, as, as hurricanes. And as, as you know, as, as Caribbean nationals, you know, um, we experience hurricanes, um, well, uh, you know, the last few years we have not, this is predicted to be a, a, a very active year. And even in, in hurricane barrel, which is the one we've seen this year, I'm, I'm sure you've seen the images coming out of Cariacou, Union Island, Jamaica, and so on. And yes, great devastation, right? And our ability to bounce back from, from these impacts, our resilience factor is very low, right? Because we're, 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 we're heavily, um, we're societies uh, with a great debt overhangs and so on. Um, and, and this is why, yes. so a state goes through these these impacts obviously they need to to borrow or either on concessionary terms or from other sources to try to rebuild uh and one of the things and and and, and I, I i can say something briefly on 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 why uh loss and damage or, or uh, as well as other mechanisms related to climate finance are are, are critical for us is uh even though we're all term small and developing states some of us are 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 in the international financial system categorized differently so in 2019 for example or 2017 for example when uh hurricane uh, Irma would have devastated the island of and uh, the the twin island state of Antigua and Barbuda so it would have hit Barbuda and, um, and basically uh demolished the entire island uh and, and and then we had 2019 hurricane Dorian in in um the Bahamas. Now, states such as the Antigua and Barbuda, the Bahamas and and, Bar and Barbados, and I believe uh, uh, Trinidad and Tobago also, because of their their GDP, um, are term more develop developing states. Now, the act of so we're developing states, we have vulnerabilities, but because of the metrics of the international system, we are not considered i suppose the poor of the poorest and this means that it, it, it impacts on your ability to borrow or or the terms on which you will be borrowed it, it excludes you from some um sources of 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 of, of loans okay. and other grants and so on and uh, but the bottom line is this then cascades into your ability to bounce back put people back as far as possible to where they were when these storms impacted. Um, and, and we've seen, this has been raised by several leaders. I, I, I know uh, I was at a conference in 2021 when um, the Prime, the Prime Minister of, of Antigua raised this at a forum with the World Bank and so on. And of course, we know in the Caribbean, our, our um, the Prime Minister of, of Barbados, uh, Her Excellency Mayor Moore Motley, has raised this uh, stringently uh, at various fora and has proposed the, the bridge. Bridgetown um, initiative in the Bridgetown 2.0. Um, uh, 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 wider field um, to France, um, and, and this is coming out of a, a, a conference which um, they would have, uh, at which Prime Minister Motley would have spoken. France and Vanuatu, because France would have been at some point the colonial power of Vanuatu, have 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 um, put forward what is called the Ifiro. Um, plan. And all of these, what they have in common is addressing some of the inequities and imbalances of the world financial system. And essentially, uh, there it's a call to reconceptualize and remodel the system 
to one which fa- um is more favorable and faces the realities or or, or, or or contemplates the realities faced by states which are most vulnerable to climate change, which includes small island and developing states. Um, so I, I think uh, if we look at, at, at how Caribbean states ha, are looking, they've, they've, they've done, um, they, they are embarking on or can uh, um, have, are, be, are, pushing processes across the gamut, both, uh, not both, um, on the mitigation, adaptation, as well as loss and damage um, uh, to address the impacts. And, and perhaps the reasons I said is because of their increased vulnerability. It's not the only one because there are other sources, but by far it's, it's, it's the most targeted action. And consequently, of course, it is the most um, controversial action. So we've seen uh, beginning in the, in the, uh, the, the, as I said, coming up, up from Paris in 2015, where the, where the 1.5 goal was achieved, uh, sorry, not, not achieved, was identified. Um, cops have struggled to 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 address it. And while we have addressed like uh, increased uh, funding for forests and oceans, and and in, in the uh imposition of a, a a loss and damage fund the real elephant in the room is how are we going to uh, phase out uh the use of fossil fuels uh and, and this is the imagination going to be an easy process because most the most of the, the the things we do are powered by fossil fuels however they, it, it's kind of like fiddling while Rome burns. The longer we take to do to, 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 to do targeted actions, the more difficult it's going to become. Uh, of course, the main mechanism, and this has been embarked on in many parts of the world, are to, again, um, utilize renewables as well as things such as, because I'm as I mentioned, transportation is a main sector. So things such as e-vehicles, um, vehicles which don't run on, on, on fossil fuels. Uh, but these are uh, this is a this is a process which can't be uh, you click a switch and uh, and and happens because many renewables are still uh in while some for example um solar and wind are are more along the development trajectory are more developed and available others are still more experimental or not as commercially viable as yet um but globally, I would say we are kind of because of the implications, I suppose, or especially to more global north or industrialized economies, uh, we've been struggling with with how we're going to address this at, at 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 the global level. They have used what they call phase down instead of phase out. Uh, but it, it's uh, I would say. It's one of the largest elephants in the room. We've seen the la the, the three so the three last cops, including the one that we will be held later this year, have been held in 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 oil rich states. Last year, there was a tremendous oil and gas lobby, uh, and included in that lobby is to uh, consider green options for um oil and gas. But the the fundamental bottom line is that once you burn oil and gas or coal that's the other main one the byproduct is carbon dioxide and and there's no getting away from that uh one of the stances taken by um by caribbean or uh, i shouldn't say caribbean only but including caribbean states but also global south states is that even though they may be producing fossil fuels they export it uh and it, it, in many ways this is a uh, again, a false dichotomy because yeah, we may not be burning it, but remember, it, it, it's a sum greater than the whole of its parts. So it doesn't matter whether it's being burned in, a, in an industrialized country or in our country. At, at the end of the day, once it goes up and it becomes part of of of, of, of the atmosphere that 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 that, that is trapping the the greenhouse gases, we all will will be impacted and. As I said, we are ju- we just stand to lose more. Um, so I I I, I think that me- in, in the in the mind of many small island developing states, the the climate negotiation process has become very frustrating. Uh, 
one of the ways, as I mentioned before, is that the, the it was it took over thirty years to get a, a loss and damage fund, and and even though the fund has been approved, there are still a, a lot of um reservations about how it will it it it, it will operate. One of the one of it is linked to the, the the global financial structure. The World Bank has been proposed to be the disbursing mechanism, and many post-colonial states have issues with the the World Bank. Uh, so, um, I guess one of the leading <laughs> reasons uh, or, or one of the leading factors is that uh, how selection of World Bank presidents are, for example, and, and, and that, of course, will set the tone for how potentially um, funds are disbursed and so on. Uh, I think um, one of the ways, one of the the latest ways in which small um small island developing states have now taken or are attempting to take industrialized nations task is through the 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 request for advisory opinions in relation to climate change so as as we we speak there well there three ex, well no two extant requests um we already have had the defining of the international tribunal for the law of the sea uh, which was a request for advisory opinion in relation to the climate um human rights and the law uh, uh, and the relationship to the law of the sea and overwhelmingly uh the the the, the, the tribunal found that uh that greenhouse gases are a form of pollution within the 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 construct of the the 19, the 1982 um unclosed convention and went on to highlight a, a, a series of very important findings which I wouldn't get into uh, uh but but you know I um they are cuz there are going to be a lot of um there's going to be a lot said about it in the next in in, in the coming years including uh, this week for example um, I have to uh, I will be on two part <laughs> of uh, webinars but that um this advisory opinion was brought by by the, the 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 commission of small island developing states and again as i mentioned earlier one of the reasons is that the marine environment is very important to small island developing states um our sister um small island developing states in the pacific have been toying with 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 either um uh, in a, in a contentious way or now as we see in an advisory capacity bringing action to the international court of justice in re in relation to the global sort south global north uh and and the the contribution of the global north to greenhouse gases so as far back as the 90s and the early 2000s um countries such as uh palau um have con considered taking the united states to court uh and this is because in many pacific states they have they have seen uh functionally parts of their their territory become um uninhabitable either because of of flooding so you have places such as the marshall islands where some of the atolls are are no, are no longer inhabitable so the, the the populations have to move and these are populations who have lived historically uh, on these islands have had to move to other islands in the atoll or we have seen in the case of pilau and other states um i'm trying to remember the other it, it's pilau and another one which have, is escaping me right now where because of salt water incursion the the arable land where they plant their staple is something called a taru uh taro sorry which is a uh, a uh, yam like uh you know like we have you know like irish have potato we have i guess what well, we have sweet potato or or cassava they have what is called a taro um and because of this the increased salinity in the soil they can't plant this so you can't plant it your fish are impacted you know how do you eat and so on so they had toyed with bringing but for many jurisdictional and other issues it this never quite gained traction however in 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 2003 uh, vanuatu after many years of of work um and and and, and i have to say not only at, at the level of the diplomacy but also there was a great youth movement involved in this including university students were able to get the un general assembly to um request an advisory opinion uh, on climate change which we we expect to hear more from the international uh, court of justice in 
uh, 2025. Uh, more regionally, we also have had the Colum- the Republics of Colombia and Chile request from the Inter-American Court um, uh, ask a broad suite of questions in relation to the link between the climate emergency and human rights. And we expect uh, some feedback on this later in this year or, or latest early next year. Um, and while Caribbean states are not an active part uh, of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. We are more active in the Commission. Uh, we do have we as sixteen states. We do fall within the large um, body of Latin America and the Caribbean. And these the, the pronouncements of the Inter American Court will be important for us. Now, the, the these while these advisory opinions are of course non binding. Uh, we've seen historically that advisory opinions are are gauging the temperature of courts and of course can find themselves into later judgments in 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 contentious jurisdiction and i think this will be an important first step in not only linking the human rights aspect to the climate emergency but also uh by which uh global south states including small island developing states can further push action in addition to the in addition to the um climate change framework and and that process um so in other words, it, it it's 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 a, it, it's gonna be uh uh it's kind of like we're chewing bubble gum and walking. We can, action is now at at many fronts. Um, I yeah, yeah I yeah I think I I can stop there. <laughs> so oh, so can I say, you tell us now about the obstacles? What obstacles have small island developing so states on, encountered we in international fora concerning climate justice uh, for many years? However, I I what I I I will point out is that we also um and I and and this is when I think one of the, the, the things I, I I often underscore is their strength in numbers, which I I, I I wish we as Caribbean people remember more. Um so in terms of the 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 climate change mechanism, just the the sheer complexity and 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 an intricacy of of the framework uh to to be able to act actively um engage can be, can be overwhelming for any one state so most of our um negotiation on 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 climate matters as well as uh, and other international matters such as under the UN convention on biological diversity for example are done through an umbrella called aosis for example and Caribbean states also negotiate with what we call the GRULAC, the Group Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, so uh, our negotiations under the International Plastics Treaty, for example, is done with, with, with AOSIS and GRULAC. Um, and this is to overcome, as I said, capacity. Um, and and this is no not meaning that we don't have capacity in, in, the, re- in the region. We do. We have you know, many brilliant persons um, coming out of the university, working in 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 both the public, private sector, NGOs, and so on. But because of the intricacy and and the pervasive nature of the climate problem, um, you know, often for any one state, I mean, some of our states have. 50,000 people, 90,000 people, their entire population. So having experts that can adequately address the broad gamut of issues can be daunting. So this is where, um, you know, we come together on the CARICOM, GRULAC, um, AOSIS to try to, to address the problem, uh, uh, especially at negotiations. And even, even with strength in numbers, it can be done. In, um, I remember last year, the at the 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 COP um twenty eight negotiations, the problems encountered by AOSIS, um you know, and and often as I said, it's the David versus Goliath um that dichotomy where you know the industrial nations uh, aim to set the agenda, um uh, and so for example when they were having the the final um outcome document aosis was not in the room something which uh, the then chair or the current chair of aosis lamented um and in addition to which uh so the the the, the inequities in in negotiating power is a critical one but then we also have uh and capacities are not a critical one but uh, also 
finance. Uh, so s- simple. Um, so we have finance to, you know, in terms of res- resilience and so on. But, oh, I, 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 you know, I, I, what I highlight and, um, you know, many uh, persons from the global south will say, you know, the process is um, more inclusive and, you know, you know, the voices of all states can be heard. Uh, yes, in theory, this is so, but to, uh, if you've ever been at a cop, it is a one a tremendously overwhelming experience. It, 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 it's kind of like the zoo has come to town, and I, I and I don't mean that um in, in in any bad manner, but it's a, a group of persons from all over the world descend on the, the the given city. Um, and the conference you have several parallel sessions. You have a lot going on all at once in a very concentrated period of time. Now, as, as small states, our delegations don't go into the hundreds. We have small delegations, which limits our ability to meaningfully participate. And on a more practical level, even getting to the conference can be a challenge. Um, and I've highlighted this in many fora that the 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 relics or this the relics of colonialism and the the are are, are still with us because in many in many cases uh many global south states not only the costs to travel to these conferences and i will not um i i want to acknowledge that there is increased funding for members of small island developing and global south states to travel to these conferences but again funding is limited and you, you come back to the same issue of small delegation but also in many cases you need to get visas you know the whole uh you know which i mean i do from a practical standpoint understand why visas are required but also we're we're battling a problem which basically you came into our countries pillaged our resources went on to industrialize and now we're suffering i think that if if i'm coming to a, a conference on climate change at least that can be done is that visas and so can be facilitated for my delegation i mean uh you've we don't hear a lot about this, but on the sidelines of a lot of these conferences, you will hear delegates speaking about, and, and, and for example, in the post-COVID period, a lot of delegates from the Pacific and so could not get to the Glasgow conference because visas were needed. And many of us are former colonies of the uh, of the UK. We now require visas. Many still do. Um, some don't, some do. Um, but if you have a delegation coming to the climate forum, and I'm not trying to in any way dictate the immigration policies of any state, but we're coming to address an issue that's globally important that you majorly contributed to. Some concessions should be made. So these are, we may not think of them as major obstacles, but if they are, they contribute to the effective participation in the process. And when you're already at a David and Goliath um, dichotomy, um, every every bit um, or, or every obstacle can really, uh, you know, lead to, the, you know, it, 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 um, inequal participation. Um, I, many states, I do think, are becoming disillusioned and daunting, and and, and this is why we we we've seen um, the, the increase in advisory opinions and calls for reforming of the the world um, financial structure and so on. Because uh, while I, 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 but but I want to end by saying that even though we're not David and Goliath situation, I think what I, I sometimes comfort myself is that that story turned out well uh, for the. <laughs> Davids of this world. Uh, so um, I don't think, I, but in no means, despite these obstacles, are 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 states giving up? I, I, and I do think that in many ways we're punching above what is given to us. We're making the best of what we have, and and we will have to continue to. Um, and I think a lo- uh, one of the main ways is to do it, 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 is to do this in numbers uh, and in shared interest. At this point will take a quick break and we'll be right back.
you for staying with us. Um, Ms. Lancaster, before the break, you were just giving us an overview of some of the obstacles that uh, small island developing states encounter in addressing the, the climate issues. I want us to switch mm -hmm. gears now, and I want you to tell us, are you confident that the international community will be able to arrive at a solution to the climate crisis? Uh, well, I, I I have to say at, there are some times when it, it looks like we're further away than ever, and then there are times when it looks like we've made real progress. Uh, I I, I I think we need to approach the the problem with the understanding that we need to find a solution. Uh, I, I, and I and the reason why we need to find a solution is is, is simply for for humankind, um, man man and womankind. I right now there there are debates as to whether we've entered what is called the Anthropocene or the era of 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 man made influence, but and that's uh where while there's you know debate in the uh I guess the archaeological community or whatever community I I forget what the international body that deals with that I think at most levels we have agreed uh, or certainly within the climate um sphere we agree we're in the Anthropocene and increasingly the window is narrowing for action to be taken uh. And and why I say we need to find a solution is that I I think ultimately while we are you know decimating ecosystems and species and their clear impacts on human beings, what what history has taught us is that uh you know the earth will implode and you know it will continue of that I'm sure. So if we as a a, a species Homo sapiens want to save not only ourselves. But I'm particularly more concerned about the future generations or, you know, the, the people who are children and those who will will be the future generations, because this is a problem which every every minute, every day, every month, every year that we delay action, we are making their lives more miserable and, uh, 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 and, and they're, they're basically bequeathing bequeath, bequeath them a, 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 a problem that is not any of their making. So I, I, what, what? So my, from my perspective, it's that it's we face a Herculean task, but it's a problem what we must address, and I, and it's something we owe to um the the gen, um you know the future generations. Why? And I'm not by any means saying that this is a problem we created, but it certainly isn't. This was a problem that was created. I mean, colonial and 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 pre-industrial and post-industrial times, but as a a global body, we are in the era where we still have an opportunity to do something about it, and it it is imperative on us. And I when when I mean us, I mean from small and developing states to um um other global south states, the global north states, and I think this is the perspective that we need to take. Right now, there are signs of of the glimmers of, of hope, but there are also uh, dark clouds on the horizon. And I think we, we, we need to keep pushing. So you have your bright spots, such as the, the, the loss and damage fund, um, the, these advisory opinions. And I, I, and I know some think um, that we put in a great store in them, but I, uh, I, I, I cannot stress enough that even though they're not legally binding they are one of the things that they are 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 and, and if you look at the hearings for itlos and i'm sure there will be hearings for the icj i'm not sure that those will be televised um and certainly if you look at the hearings for the inter-american court you realize that the 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 mindset of 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 of, of of international law is changing uh, from, you know, the, the Western perspective to a more, uh, I suppose, what scholars call a third world or a fourth world approach. So um, these are, 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 are continued glimmers of hope, even as we struggle, we, we have another COP coming up, which optimistically, uh, um, you know, we don't see any revolutionary changes coming. Uh, and as I mentioned before, one of the critical changes that we have dragged our feet on is the phase out of 
of of coal and 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 fossil fuels and and have it and essentially how are we gonna make this happen? Because it's, as I said, it's not gonna happen overnight. And the longer we prolong that, and yes, I I know the arguments of its impact on societies and so on, but um. Often we kick these cans down the road and say, you know, we need our people to develop. But, you know, develop at what cost? Um, if if you have uh, uh, something that is clearly impacting and, uh, you know, impacting how people live, where people live and their livelihood. Because, you know, uh, I do a lot of work in, in, in coastal communities and small scale fisheries, for instance which are support uh economically most of the people in 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 not most of the people a large percentage of the people in in the global south it, including small island developing states and it's also important fisheries are also important because it's it it's you know the um the most reasonable available protein so they're linked to food and nutrition security but with warmer oceans this is an added impact on fisheries uh, which is already struggling from overfishing and a lot of other issues. And so ultimately, what is development if you, if the people you're developing for can eat properly, can are displaced from their homes, um, become climate migrants? Because these are not, um, you know, these are not the stuff of sci-fi anymore. These are realities. We're seeing climate migration in, in our Caribbean region. So. When Barbuda was decimated, there was climate there was climate migration and and and, and issues of stem from climate migration. In the case of Barbuda, uh, uh, in their case, they became uh, essentially a, a land grab. In Bahamas, I mean, luckily the Bahamas is is an archipelago, so um, those who were impacted were able to move to another island within the state. Uh, but I often say, you know, people don't play. You know, at least they had somewhere to go. But I, I asked many people, would you like to be just one day living in your ho- home, Um, which regardless of how posh or how humble it is, it's your home. It's where, you know, your castle, right? And and one day something happens and you, you don't have this anymore. You're forced to move. Many of us would not. So if, if you think about that and amplify it to communities, to people having to move um, from places where they're historic, Historically, and should uh, um so in the case of of of, of indigenous people, where from maybe time immemorial, as we like to say in law, uh, as well as traditional people who are brought um from Africa or Asia during it, um slavery and indentureship, have, and have been practicing um fisheries, agriculture, and the traditional methods on these lands, and suddenly they're uprooted again. So. These are 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 the realities of or the downside of of if if of 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 the climate that we're developing. Yes, I I don't I w- I wouldn't deny that we need to develop and give our people some basic um standard of living. But at, at what cost? Because if we develop on these, you know, climate migration and and poor food and nutrition security, loss of livelihood, loss of of of, of of, of many of the human rights, uh, the right to a healthy environment, which was recently recognized. If all of these are lost, why are we developing? Um, and 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 if we cease, or 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 or, or many of our peoples are impacted, um, why 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 are we developing? And and um, at that you know the cost is too high. So we we need to find a solution. Um, I I. And I think the solution would come from a a, a multitude of processes, um, and not solely within the 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 UN uh, climate change convention, which I think uh, many small island states and global south states are going increasingly disillusioned. Uh, but having said that, it is the global mechanism, the global fora, and will be important to 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 processes to to to, to get in the solution. But this will then be complemented by uh, our whatever action will come from our advisory opinion. And another key area is the financial aspect because finance, climate finance is, is, is linked to um, capacity building, um, new technology um, and, and, and best available technology and these things. Uh, so calls such as that uh, by uh, Prime Minister Motley in the Bridgetown 2.0 initiative 
the Euro call to action by France and Vanuatu are, are other parts of the puzzle. And of course, it would be remiss of me not to point out that the, the call for climate justice and climate reparations by many uh, former colonial states to get some and, 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 and climate justice and, and, and reparations will take many of the forms that, that I have mentioned before, including finance, but also uh, attribution you know, a uh, greater weight being placed to attribution science and, 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 and these things in which we we recognize um, as a global community that some states have been wrong and they and and they because of historical wrongs as well as current wrongs, they need to be uh this needs to be set right. And and I, I hesitate to say compensated because I I don't want it to seem that a, a compensation or a, or a transaction will solve this problem. We need real boots in the ground action, uh, changes in the way we do things because compensation, how do you compensate for the loss of a community's loss to their ancestral lands and so on? These, these are things that cannot be comp- adequately compensated, but um, Right and wrong include uh, a major part of it will be strengthening mitigation action, preventing further wrong from happening, and ensuring that that states which are more vulnerable have uh, the finance, the, the capacity, and the technology uh, to 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 adapt and and access funds for loss and damage. I, I think perhaps that's the best way I could summarize it. As we get ready to wrap up, uh, Ms. Lancaster, in this extended episode, I just want you to tell us, uh, how do you envision <laughs> the role of CARICAM as it relates mm-hmm. to future advoc- advocacy of climate issues mm-hmm. on the world stage? All right, well, I, 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 the, I think the first place to begin is the fact that CARICOM has made some, uh, well, first of all, it's, it is within the mandate of, of, of the CARIC, um, of CARICOM under the revised Treaty of Shagaramas. You have uh, the, the Council of, of Trade and the Environment. One of the areas in which they ought to take a lead on is, is climate and, 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 of course, the, the corollary of that energy, which they have. We, ha- we do have an energy policy. We do have several mechanisms aimed at, at promoting uh, renewable energy, such as the CICRI, which is the Caribbean um, Renewable Energy Authority agency, I forget. Uh, anyway, C- uh, called CICRI. Um, and we do have a, a regional center, the Five C Center, which addresses um, uh, w- which addresses climate change. So it's a way of 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 facilitating funding for climate adaptation and mitigation efforts. There have also been several projects which have been led by CARICOM. Uh, I perhaps and 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 in as a run up, for example, to COP twenty eight, um, CARICOM states facilitated the meeting of CARICOM small and developing states in developing uh, uh their uh basis for action and their call to action uh ahead of 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 the the COP twenty eight. And I think it is in in this vein, and and we have seen um it before it before in a recent example of the of, of CARICOM coming together as 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 a a a body as states coming together to address um negotiations for the uh the agreement the BBNJ agreement. So as 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 a body, CARICOM uh, put together a, a formidable group. Which um dealt with various aspects, so it would have included persons working in 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 you know the foreign affairs ministries, research mm-hmm. universities such as myself, uh, as well as NGOs and so on to come together to help uh, shape the negotiations uh on the four the four key areas, and I think that that worked well because. Unlike previous negotiations, we had a position which which is it was indigenous to us. So, for example, during meetings, you know, we were put into various groups de- depending on your expertise. So, um, 
healthcare, your base management systems, uh, for example, in, in, in my case, or strategic environmental assessment. So you really pull on the regional core to, to, um, to, to get uh, your expertise and to develop a position. And in a similar way, I, I was heartened when I saw uh, prior to the COP28, as a collective body, we put a statement out in re respect to what we saw as important um, to um, what we saw as important to be achieved at, at COP28. Uh, the, and recently, uh, so this would not only in not only CARICOM, CARICOM is the major group in to which Caribbean SIDS belong. We would have seen the SIDS for conference where countries came up with a road plan, a, a road plan as to where SIDS are going to go. And of course, this would include climate action. So I think what I want to underscore is that there's strength in numbers. And coming back to my David and Goliath analogy, um, one of my criticisms is often as CARICOM states, we try to go it alone as individual states for, 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 for many, many reasons. And I, I think we need to re remember where when it work, things work well, when we go together with, so, and we need to, to forget our differences on this specific issue because it's so fundamental to much of what many Caribbean states or CARICOM states are, are trying to achieve. Uh, we're all trying to develop. We're competing with each other for tourism and so on. But ultimately, if we don't address this issue, um, we all will, I don't want to say perish. I don't want to sound like a doomsday prophet, but we all will be impacted. I mean, uh, I, I, and I keep coming back to Beryl because that's just precious in our memory. And, and sometimes I think when things like this happen, we catalyze the action, but then we forget again. So, you know, when Irma and Maria and David, there's a lot of, uh, not David, Irma, Maria and Dorian, there was a lot of action and then things were quiet for the next few hurricane seasons. And now we have Beryl and now there's a lot of that chatter again. But we need to move from the perspective as CARICOM states that many of the fundamental tenets are, are under which we join the revised Treaty of Chagaramas, trade, development, advancement of, of Caribbean peoples and social and cultural development will be undermined if, if there's not um, climate action. And while I do recognize that we can't do this alone as, as, as a, a 15 member body, uh, we, we, and we need global action. We are, are not a, in our most formidable position if we do it individually as opposed to the collective. So we need to either to 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 double down on 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 being a strong um regional body. Um, and and I often say, you know, we often say CARICOM, and we often forget that we do have two regional bod two main regional bodies. I am of course referring to the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, who I I I I, I have to to highlight are doing uh, quite a, a bit in terms of climate change and 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 action related to the ocean based aspect of climate change, and which they should be credited for. Uh, and and I often say, I, I mean, I'm not the only person who says it, but action there 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 at times seems to be more concerted and 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 synchronized action within OECS, and this and maybe this can be scaled up to, to uh, in in some areas to CARICOM because all OECS members are of course members of CARICOM. Um, yes, we do have challenges and and history and so on, but I think once we look at it from the fundamental premise that that despite whatever the, the, the obstacles, we all are vulnerable and and will face um will face tremendous uh setbacks to to our economies and our people and and loss of much of the environment on 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 which both our peoples and economies rely. Um, I I, I think that is where Caricom needs to focus and. Uh, and one of the ways I've highlighted two examples of of strength. One of the the disappointments I I think was in the um on the, in the lead up to the, the advisory opinion for the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, in which the Commission of Small Island Developing States, which was which was formed primarily with the aim of asking 
So this this was a commission that was formed on the sidelines of the Glasgow uh, COP26, specifically uh, to bring together small and developing states to, to go to Itlos to ask this question. And if we look at the membership of 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 Coasis, so Coasis was formed uh, by uh, the Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda, uh, Gaston Brown, and the Prime Minister of Vanuatu, whose name escapes me at the moment. But they were the founding members. And it, 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 since then, we've had more Pacific SIDS join um, COISIS than we've had um, CARICOM SIDS. And uh, Antigua is a member of, of CARICOM. And one of the things that I know when we were leading up to the hearings in September in 2023, uh, say, you know, the, the, the lawyers and, uh, and, and many persons for COISIS were encouraging member states to to join some have joined but i i often wonder um you know ultimately this is a problem not only those states and and specific states that have joined will face and whatever came out will, will be a, a a plus to us all so you know the moral support is is necessary despite whatever positions we may have um and really for me in the next you know given the the very supportive and um advisory opinion we do have and the 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 the, the momentum that will that that will pick up that will ultimately culminate with the ICJ opinion advisory opinion i i think we need to harness this togetherness and energy and and propel that further into the the climate negotiations as we go to the COPs, because I think the next few COPs are going to be critical. And we say this every year, but, you know, we're we're fast approaching a, a level where, you know, uh, we as a world will be um, basically at the ravages of the, the climate. And I, and I you know, I, I know they're naysayers, but we, we, we see it, we feel it. Um, and for us, who are the front lines, the canary in the coal mines, we really by all means necessary need to 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 push action and when it be it will wet and it will be as i mentioned previously on a, 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 a several fronts um and therefore we as caricom simply need to 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 be more proactive and and i think come together um and perhaps maybe it it, it doesn't need to begin with 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 CARICOM, um, it can begin in the OECS and then um, scale up to CARICOM. Oh, exactly. Well, Alana Lancaster, uh, <laughs> environmental and human rights lawyer, lecturer in international environmental energy law and head of the newly formed Environmental Law, Ocean Governance and Climate Justice Unit. Thank you very much for stopping by. Thank you, Colin. I'm happy to have finally <laughs> done it. I, I hope I've done it justice, uh, simply because I, I, I was a bit unprepared, but I tried to pull from uh, what I've been recently working on in my past experience in, in, in not only environmental law, but environmental management. So hopefully I've, 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 I've shed some light or contributed to some, in some small measure. And I'd like to congratulate you and your co-host on a stellar series. And I, I, I wish you all the best and keep up the good work. Thank you for listening to the Legal Corner podcast series. For more information, please visit us at our Facebook or Instagram pages or send your comments to the Legal Corner Podcast at gmail.com. We look forward to hearing from you.